Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. With the fall quickly arriving, that also signals the start of fall craft fair season. We've been attending craft fairs for the last couple years and we have found them to be a valuable source of not only new customers, but also that valuable additional income. In the process of gearing up for the fall craft fairs, we like to step back and review the products we sold last year and then see what is currently trending this year and then take stock of what we have. Last year, one of the most popular items, not only at the craft fairs that I attended, but also on the internet were lanterns made out of cedar. The fun part of lanterns is where you can carve various faces into them, providing a wide range of customization possibilities and also a little bit of seasonal variety. In that regard, these lanterns are not only perfect for fall and Halloween, but they also make great decorations for Christmas and Thanksgiving. Based on the research I've done so far this year, it's not entirely clear if these lanterns will be as popular this season as they were last. However, I do think they will be fairly popular and we'll be able to sell a few of them at our fall craft festivals. Last year I created a jig to help me with the construction of the lanterns and to make the process of milling just a little bit more simple. As we begin gearing up for fall craft fairs this year, I've decided to upgrade that jig and make it a little bit easier to use and more functional for different designs. In this video, I'd like to show you the process I used to design the jig, how I constructed it, and also the design that I created for the lantern that is both highly functional, but more importantly, capable of being flat packed and shipped. Having the ability to flat pack the lantern not only decreases the shipping costs, but it also makes packaging significantly more simple and opens the door for a lot more configurability of the lantern by the customer. So what I would like to do is pivot over to Fusion 360, walk you through the process that I used to design the lantern and the jig, show you some of the tool paths, and then ultimately show you the finished jig as well as the lantern. I will make the Fusion file available for download, which should save you a ton of time if you want to make some of these this holiday season. All right, let's go ahead and shift over to Fusion, and then we'll get on with the video. All right, so here we are in Fusion 360. What you see in front of you is the design that I came up with. I'm going to walk you through it very quickly and then pivot over to some of the uh, cam operations that I've come up with. So you have a single component here called Lantern. It is made up of a couple different components, the top, the side and the front, and then the stem. Those are uh, individual components. And then I have a copy of the side and a copy of the front. Uh, so in Fusion, you don't need to recreate parts if they're identical to each other. You just need to copy them and paste them. And that's what I've done here. So just pivoting around here a little bit, you can see what I have is I have these front and back, if you will, they're both called front, but front and back are slotted into the sides and the sides kind of sandwich into the top there. And then if I were to turn those off, side, stem, side, front, what you see is the top here just has this little island in the middle and that just sits down right in the middle of the sides in the front here. You can see if I turn the turn this on right here, you can see the profile view. That's pretty cool. There's a little bit of relief here. There's a little bit of tolerance that I left so that if there's a little bit of misalignment, you still should be able to get it in. I've tested this, it works pretty well. Uh, and so that is the high level design right there. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is turn that off and then turn on the jigs that I have created to go along with milling this here. So what you see here are there are three separate jigs, one here for the top, one for the sides that need milling. The other sides don't need milling, it's just a square, so I just cut those on the table saw. And then the third one here is for the stems. You can see here I put a little cam clamp in that allows you to clamp the material down and so you can have various sizes of the material. So what I do there is the off cut from the pieces that are left where they're not quite long enough to make a side or a top out of. I don't have one lying here right now, uh, but they're a little bit smaller, a little bit shorter, so you can just uh, use that cam clamp to tighten that down, and then you don't need to have a perfect friction fit there. Okay, so that is the jig, That are the those are the parts. So let's go ahead and pivot over to the manufacturing workspace. 
Now, at first blush, this looks really complicated. It is really not. This is some of the beauty of Fusion 360. It's also some of the learning curve that you kind of need to get beyond. So what I've done here is I've collapsed all the cam. And so I have different workspaces here. I have a jig workspace, the top, front, stems, and faces. Those are all different ways to organize your, uh, your tool paths. You can also have different work coordinate systems for each one of your workspaces if you want. You can put it all in one if you want as well. I just find this just a little bit easier. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to expand this jig here and show you what I've done. So you can see this kind of a yellowish thing here is the stock that I've set up. This is arbitrary. Mine happened to be a certain size, so I made the stock that size. You definitely obviously need stock that is gonna be big enough to put these jigs on it. Like I said earlier, uh, you can mill them out individually or just do one big long one like I did here. There are registration holes on the corner of each one of these jigs so that you can put them back down in your wasteboard and have them be in the exact same location every single time. So I find that's useful and they are spaced out to be identically in the same locations. Each one of these jigs is the same width and the same height. So I've turned off everything and let's go ahead and walk through the cam for the jig real quickly here. So what you see here is the first cut, which is a contour cut that literally, if you can see here, the blue line, that is literally just outlining the, the size of the jig. And like I said earlier, I made one just big jig. You can do this one for every one of them if you want. It's very easy. You can just copy this contour and then change what you wanna cut. Uh, next we have here, which is the bulk of the work for the jig cutting. This is where I pocket out most of the area where the pieces will fit in. I did this with a three quarter inch bowl cutting bit. That is the fastest way to get this result. Still, it's gonna take about 35 minutes or so. So that's a fair amount of time, but it's not too, too horrible. All right, next I have a little pocketing operation here to cut out these little tabs. Um, I, I played around a little bit with how I was doing the milling and the, the first attempt these tabs were required. In the second attempt, they're only required for the, for the sides here. You don't need them for the top, but I just left them in. It's just easier to leave them in than take them out. Uh, next, we have the bore operation. If you want to create holes in Fusion 360, a bore operation is the way to go. You can also do drilling. I don't have any drill bits, so I used a regular end mill in the bore operation here to create those registration marks as well as the little dog uh, holes here on the corner and that allows the end mill to get into that corner and make a square corner. So contour here. This is just a cleanup path. I mentioned earlier I used a bowl cutting bit. It has a round over on the sides. So what I did is I chose to use a 1 8 inch end mill to clean up these sides so they have a nice 90 degree and the pieces fit down in them really, really nice. It worked out pretty well. It's not perfect. I could probably use a second uh, cleanup path uh, a little bit with an offset, um, but it's good enough for this purpose here. Uh, next is just another contour path here as well. And this gets a little bit closer into the corners as well and cuts a little bit away for the relief and it does a final cleanup path. So that is the jig. Let's go ahead and let's uh, pivot over here to the, uh, the rest of the tooling pass. And so what we have is for the top cam, it's very straightforward. Uh, you just have the two top pieces in place and it's milling out that little island in the middle. This is probably a good time to go back and turn, <laughs> turn the um, stock on so you can actually see them. All right, so what you see here, when you select this cam operation here for the top, uh, you have a pocket here which cleans out most of that material here and then another pocket which cleans out that center bit for the stem. They're two different operations because they have two different uh, bottom heights, uh, but otherwise they're very, they're essentially the same cut just with slightly different geometry. Okay, next we have the front. Uh, this is just a simple up and down path. This is a little bit hard to do in Fusion because there's two separate components here. So I did create an additional sketch and uh, use the sketch profile uh, to create this tool path. But the good news is you don't have to worry about any of that because I did it for you and it works beautifully. I've made, I can't tell you how many of these and it works really, really well. And because of the jig and the way the jig works with that little cutout, uh, there's, uh, there's no tear out, there's no blow out on the side whenever it's making those paths, which is something I had with the last jig that I had last year. All right, next we have the stems. Uh, this is just very straightforward. Uh, 
just three stems here. You could do more. There is some space to do more. However, I wanna make sure that the grain orientation is vertical so that when you stick that stem down into this hole, it doesn't snap off. When I have stems where the grain orientation is horizontal, I found that they were snapping off very easily. When someone pick it up, it would just snap off because the cedar is a very, very soft wood. And so I tried to stay away from that. Okay, so the last area that I wanna dig into is the faces. And so I'm gonna go through these one by one. Right now I have uh, five different faces here. There are two pieces on each one. So five is actually 10 different faces. You can mill these however you want. Right now they are milled as pairs. If you wanna make them individually, you can certainly do that just by copying the tool path and just deselecting the other, the other contour. All right, so what we have here is what I call the happy faces. Uh, These are your kind of two sort of uh, what I would call a little bit more like actors or whatever, uh, just happy faces right there. And then I'm calling these stitch faces. These are kind of fun. They look uh, kind of um, like um, the Halloween-ish with the little like your, uh, I had sewn the mouse's shut or something like this. Then we have a uh, Frankenstein and then a vampire. These were very popular last year at the show. They were the first ones to sell out. The next one that I have is what I call the traditional sort of pumpkin faces or jack-o'-lantern faces here. You just have the kind of triangles as eyes and nose and a little triangular mouth. Uh, these are very straightforward. These also proved to be very popular last year. So I hope they will sell equally well this year. And the last one I have is just uh, two different bats, one hanging upside down and one kind of flying. Um, these were, uh, I think they were fairly popular. They weren't as popular as the traditional faces, uh, but there's some people who saw them, they fell in love with them, they immediately bought them. And so I would say it's a little bit more of a personality driven thing, uh, but these were very popular as well. All right, so that is the cam. That is what you get if you want to get this file. All right, let's go ahead and um, uh, let's pivot over to uh, showing the final product. All right. Here is the finished jig. As you can see, it has three different spaces for the top, front, and stems, and has the ability to carve two front pieces at once, two tops, and three stems. You can also create the jig as three separate pieces or one large one like I did. I chose MDF since I had some laying around, but you can use any wood. Whatever you have laying around will work. Given the size, I don't think 3D printing would be a good choice, but if you do happen to have a printer capable of printing something this large, then certainly that is an option. After creating the jig, I milled some wood to the appropriate dimensions and tested it out. After doing a little testing, I made some tweaks to the lantern design as well as the jig. One big change I would like to make in the future is the use of cam clamps for holding all the pieces down rather than a friction fit. This just guarantees better holding power when the stock isn't quite the right size or the right shape. Here is the lantern in its final form after carving. As you can see, it has the uh, two sides and the front and the back, as well as the top. Now I have not put the stem in here yet, but there is a hole carved in for it. So putting this together is super simple. You simply just slide the sides into the slots that are milled into the front and back, and then carefully put the top on. I find starting on one side and then moving on to the other side to be the easiest, but it's your choice how you want to assemble this. The top does have an island of sorts carved into it, which makes putting the uh, top on a little bit easier and helps with alignment. And I think it actually helps hold it together a little bit better as well. So it does make putting it all together a little bit easier. You do have the option to nail or glue the parts together, but I find keeping the parts loose makes it easier to store when it's not in use. Once you have the lantern fully constructed, simply add an LED of your choice, and then you're off to the races. One note here, I would not recommend using a real candle. Cedar is very flammable and we would not want to catch anything on fire and potentially cause any damage to your house or your property. So now that we have one built, let's take a page out of Hamilton's playbook and talk briefly about the cost, both in terms of time and material. One six foot plank of cedar fence material provides enough material for two full lanterns. Each plank costs about $4, which is dependent on your location. So the raw cost of materials for the lantern is about $2. But that's not the whole story. There is time and material involved with milling on your CNC. And there is some wear and tear in your machine that you should account for and bake that into the cost of the lantern. The time to mill this jig is about an hour and the time to mill a single lantern with a face is about 11 minutes. Accounting for changing materials and bits and whatnot, we'll round that up to say 20 minutes per lantern. 
I usually charge about $20 an hour for milling, so that's an additional cost of about $6 per lantern. If you purchase my plans, the labor for the design and the tool pass is essentially zero, so you would not necessarily need to factor that in here. However, I did put about five hours into the design, the jig, and the tool pass, so that would normally be an additional $200 or so of sunk cost, which you would need to factor into the pricing of your lantern. With the labor and the material, each lantern costs about $8 to make, so a fair market price would be around $15 to $20. I think we sell them for $15 or two for 25, and that seems to be a reasonable price in our area that most people are willing to spend. As I mentioned, I will make these plans available on my website, link down in the description, if you wanna make some of your own. I will provide a number of different faces with the file and hopefully continue to update the file with additional faces over time. So I do encourage you to continue to check back frequently for new revisions. If you like this project and you think making lanterns is interesting, consider leveling up your projects by checking out these 15 epic sources for model and project ideas right here. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for getting this far. And don't forget to be inspired.